The transmission's out. Remember, the reason why we pulled this transmission out because it was leaking like a sieve and it was shifting funny. And so what I suspect is something majorly failed inside the transmission and damaged the front seal. So we're gonna pull the torque converter out. <laughs> I can't even get it out. It usually just slides right in. Huh, can't get this sucker out. We're gonna try to slide hammer this off and see if we can do it. I was expecting to see the seal totally wasted, but... It was doing like a stuffed pig when the engine starts. Maybe the pump gave way? Yeah. But that seal does not look bad at all. I was expecting to be like ripped up, but you said it was like pouring out like crazy. Yeah, I have a video of it. Really? So here's the old transmission, here's the new transmission. And we're gonna go over some things we noticed that the new transmission comes with and things that we need to swap over from the old transmission because the new transmission doesn't come with it. So starting on the top, the breather hose with a little breather is already attached to the top. So that's nice. So we don't have to swap this over. These two little wiring harness brackets that were a pain in the ass for us to unclip the wiring harness from, we have to swap those over. On the driver's side of the transmission, we have to swap over this shifting arm right here. And we have to swap over this bracket that the transmission cable connects to right here. On the passenger side, we have to swap over the park neutral safety switch and that's it. The two fitting lines are already on the new transmission. This sensor is on the new transmission. The last thing is this, this little breather hose right here that goes over to the transfer case. We have to swap this one over too. The first thing we're gonna swap over is the transmission neutral safety switch. It has a unique washer with little splines that hook over the nut so the nut can't loosen up. So I'm gonna get underneath there with a the flat blade screwdriver, pry them up a little bit so I can turn this nut and take it off. Okay, that should be enough. I'm working the shifter lever on the driver's side and you can see that this thing's moving. So the purpose of this is that it's not gonna let you drive the vehicle if it's broken because it's not gonna register that the vehicle's in park if it goes bad. And so that's the way it will fail. So you're wondering like, why can't I start my vehicle? What's going on or why can't I shift? It's because the park neutral safety switch went bad. I'm gonna get on here with a 22 millimeter socket and break it free. This is on very light. It's a very light torque spec. That's why they have this special claw washer to make sure it doesn't come off because it's such a light torque spec. So I gotta slide the washer off too. I'm working it, I'm working it. There's a 12 millimeter bolt that holds the park neutral safety switch to the transmission. I'm gonna zip it out with my Milwaukee ratchet. Now let's see if I could wiggle this thing off. You gotta wiggle it off the shaft. Just be gentle with it. There's some trick to this. This park neutral safety switch is made out of plastic and you have to be really careful with it. Once you get the nut off and the special claw washer off, it's really stuck on there. You have to try to slide it off the shaft and these plastic fins with gaps in between them, that's all part of the park neutral safety switch. I'm letting you know, I ended up breaking one of the fins because I just was easily prying with a small screwdriver and I broke one of the fins off because the plastic's really old and brittle. So what I suggest doing is maybe spray a little penetrant in here and then just try to get a little bit of movement, pull it out, push it back in, spray it a little more penetrant and just slowly work it off this shaft because this plastic being so old and brittle, it doesn't take much to break one of the little fins off. We epoxied it back on and we were able to fix it. When you get the nut and the washer back on, you torque this nut to 61 inch pounds. It's a really light torque spec. And then we have to bend these fins back down over the top of the nut. That's all captured. Once you have this tightened, then you could torque this to spec. I'll get you the torque spec for that. The instructions say to get the shifter in neutral from the farthest forward position, go back two notches, one, two. And then you'll see that the shaft of the shifter lever is in line with this line on the park neutral safety switch. That's a visual indicator that you have it in neutral. 
The torque spec for this bolt is 9.4 foot-pounds or 113 inch-pounds. We're using an inch-pound torque wrench. That's it. The shifter lever can go only on one way because it's got an oblong slot and you have to have the S shape facing outward. You couldn't turn it the other way, it wouldn't work. I don't have a torque spec for this, so I'm gonna use that German spec. We all know and love good anti. It might shift on you all the way to the back spot. I'm just gonna support this with my hand. Okay, that's good and tight. We also moved over some bolts that we took out and put back in the old transmission. This one was for a bracket. We swapped over these two brackets with the 10 millimeter bolts. We swapped over this bracket that's for the transmission cable. And we swapped over the breather hose and then we swapped over another bolt for a bracket that we took off and that we swapped over from the old transmission. So the new transmission is now ready to go. When you get a remanufactured transmission from Toyota, they put this metal bar strap from the bell housing to the torque converter to hold it in place. This is how it ships. So the torque converter can't fall off the input shaft. It looks like these are our 14 millimeter and we're just gonna zip these out with my little DeWalt gun. Oh, there's a nut on the back on that one. On the back end for the output shop, Toyota puts a little protective plastic piece and that's just to protect the seal. Comparing this automatic transmission to the automatic transmission on Sean's 2002 4Runner, I remember when we got the transmission from Toyota, I could easily slide the torque converter off the input shaft. And as you saw when we removed the old torque converter to take a look at the input shaft seal, I had to slide hammer this sucker off. I'm just doing some light pressure pulling back and I can't budge this thing, so I'm not gonna mess with it. So it's my guess that Toyota has it in its fully seated position all the way inboard and ready for installation on the vehicle. One thing that we're not 100% sure of, and we're gonna try to get an answer from Toyota, we don't know if they partially fill the torque converter or do they partially fill the transmission. There's a little bit of fluid. I asked Nick at Yoda One Performance and he says the capacity of these transmission is 12 quarts exactly. When we get to the point to filling it, I don't wanna overfill it if there's some in there, so, I'm gonna ask Stevens Creek Toyota and see if they could give me a definitive answer if it comes shipped with any fluid in it. It might just have some assembly fluid in there for all the moving parts. They coat it with some ATF, but I don't know if they actually have any appreciable amount in there. Another important thing is that here's the area where the starter goes. You can see the little cutout. And then the flex plate is gonna be married up to here. And then when the starter gear comes out, it's gonna contact the flex plate and then turn the transmission. Sean and I just did a test. And when we turn this, we look on the back side and we don't see the output shaft turning. What you wanna make sure you do is that you wanna get one bolt lined up in this cavity where the starter goes. So when you get the transmission married up to the engine you want to be able to get in here and get one bolt started if you didn't have one in this position you're not going to be able to turn the output shaft to get this to turn into position so it's very important you don't start off like this where you can't get to a bolt hole you want to have it to where one of these bolt holes on the torque converter is lined up right center with this area where the starter goes. And this way you could guarantee that you can turn the crankshaft, get the flex plate hole lined up with this hole, and then get one bolt started. And then once one bolt is started, now when you turn the crankshaft, the flex plate and the torque converter are gonna be turned as one, and then you get the next one to that position, and then you get another bolt started. Then you just keep on doing that till you get all six bolts started. As part of this job, since we have the transmission out, it's a smart move to replace the rear main seal. I can tell just by looking underneath the seal area, the seal lives right behind here, there's no signs of leaking. Technically, we could get away without replacing it, but it's better to do it because then if the rear main seal starts leaking, you have to redo all this painful labor to get the transmission out. So we're gonna do it. 
The flex plate is held onto the end of the crankshaft with eight 14 millimeter bolts. I'm gonna see if this little DeWalt gun's up to the task. Before I take this last bolt out, I just wanna make note that this is the rear plate. There's two plates. There's gonna be one on this side and one on the back side. So I just wanna mark this and say that's the rear plate so I don't mix them up. This is the rear plate, so you couldn't mess this up. This is like a super heavy duty plate and the other one's a lightweight plate, so there's no way you can mess this up. Okay. I mean, you could mess it up. Well, you could mess it up if you really, really tried. <laughs> okay. So now we have our rear main seal. If you know our channel, we replaced one of these when doing a clutch job and I tried to use the Lyle seal puller. That seal puller is more for like lightweight seals, like small, like camshaft and crankshaft seals. When I tried to remove a rear main seal with it, it failed pretty bad. And so then I had to go to my crankshaft and cam seal kit and I was able to get it out. But I'm gonna try a different technique. Nick at Yoda One told me the way they get these out is they take a hose pick tool, they pound it into the seal and then they lever it out. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and try that. So this is the type of hose pick tool I'm talking about. This is to assist you to get radiator hoses off and heater hoses off. They usually have a pretty sharp point. And so what Nick says you do is you get it right on the middle part of the seal, you drive it in and then lever it out. You just don't wanna get close to the crankshaft and you don't wanna get close to the housing plate. You wanna be somewhere centered, drive it in and then lever it out. Let's see how it works. Hooked a little bit. Not enough. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Nick gave good advice. That was easy. Thank you, Nick, at Yoda One Performance. And I know I didn't do any damage. So now we gotta get the new seal. Like I always say, it never hurts to match up the parts. New seal on top of the old seal. I should have probably held it up to the end of the crankshaft before mangling it, but it looks like it's the right one. So I just wanna make sure this is nice and clean, and it should be, because there's no dirt in there before. I'm gonna lubricate the end of the crankshaft with some motor oil, and I'm gonna lubricate the seal too. Get ready for my proctology <laughs> exam. Okay. I'm gonna lubricate the seal a little bit too. I'm just gonna put this up there and put it in place. Okay, it looks like I almost got it all the way in just with my hands, but now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a brass drift. It's really in mostly on this bottom left corner, but I'm gonna start tapping in with a brass drift. And what I wanna do is I wanna get it equal to the end of this seal housing. I'm just gonna go really slow. And what I'm gonna make sure I do is I overlap the brass drift onto the housing so I can't drive it in any further than the end of the housing. Just doing light taps. As soon as you hear a more solid sound, that means that you're making contact with this seal housing and you've driven it in flush. Hear that difference? Solid, solid. I'm gonna work my way around and just make sure it's all flush. In case you don't remember how the flex plate goes on, the welds will be facing out towards the back of the vehicle. The center piece right here is indented, it's concave. And then hopefully you mark this, but if you didn't mark it, it has a little bit of a lip and it's a little concave on this side. If you flipped it over, then the lip would be facing the flex plate. So you want the lip facing outboard. So it's a little concave on this side too. These bolt holes on the end of the crankshaft are through holes, meaning that the holes go all the way through the crankshaft. There's no material on the backside stopping it. So that means engine oil could potentially travel through the threads of the end of the crankshaft and cause a leak. So the way you prevent that 
is you use a little thread locker. I'm gonna use some blue 242 thread locker. That's the medium strength. I wouldn't recommend the red, that's overkill. You just want to be able to fill the threads a little bit so no engine oil can travel through the threads and get out and then cause an issue. With these bolts, it had old Loctite on them, so we took a wire brush and cleaned them up and sprayed them with a brake cleaner and got them pretty clean. So I recommend you do that too. Ooh, that's a lot. Shut my wad there. Okay, and then get one started. I'm gonna get the other one started. You don't need to see me do this. So I'm gonna get all of them started. We got all the bolts started with some blue 242 Loctite. The torque spec for these bolts is 61 foot-pounds and the factory service manual doesn't talk about doing a crossing pattern, but I'm gonna treat this just like a flywheel for a manual transmission, and they do have a tightening sequence, so I numbered them so I can follow the numbering pattern. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I'm gonna give them a little turn, each one slowly bringing them up to the spec. On the front of the engine, Ray is holding the crank bolt steady with a breaker bar and a 22 millimeter socket because this flex plate is connected to the crankshaft and the engine's gonna wanna turn if nobody's holding the crank bolt. So that's what he's doing for me. I have my 3 8 torque wrench that goes up to 100 foot pounds, got it set to 61, and I have a short extension and a 14 millimeter socket. So I'm just gonna give it a little bit of a turn on number one, little on number two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I'm gonna go back around again. One, two, three, four, five, six, 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 seven, eight. All eight flex plate bolts are now torqued to 61 foot-pounds. All right, we are ready to put the transmission in. We've got it on the transmission jack. Ray is gonna be working the jack while I'm looking for alignment. The nice thing about a transmission jack is it has two handles, one to allow you to tilt it fore and aft and another handle to tilt it left and right. With that ability, it helps you really get the alignment of the bell housing to the back of the engine and get the alignment dowels aligned. Once we get it up close, one thing that helps is you have one person looking in from each wheel well because you get a nice bird's eye view of how the alignment's looking from the wheel well with the bell housing in relation to the engine. So we can tell each other, oh yeah, you're a little bit nose high or tail high. And then we can make the adjustments with the knobs and then slowly get it closer and closer to getting the alignment. So go ahead and start jacking up, Ray. We got a long ways to go. I'm gonna get it closer. I'm gonna move it towards you a little bit. Okay, slow down a little bit. You're looking on that side, right, Tom? To be tilted down more. Right there. So we're about an inch away on this side. Go up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. Oh, oh man, now we gotta get now we gotta stop. more than an inch away. Yeah, right? Go Jeez. <laughs> hey, you know what? The alignment dowels, do you see that they're blue? Yeah. Okay, so I think it's gonna have to rotate, but go ahead and go up. We're getting How's closer. it looking on the other side, Jimmy? I'm uh, right there, right there, right, oh, there, right, right there. there. Wow, is it already? On this side, it's aligned, the top. It's aligned. <laughs> I can't really see the top. Um, is the dowel going in? Yeah. I see my dowel. You're going to have to pull, Ray, uh, or you, pull. you, Sean, you push. Somebody yeah. pushes, the other one pulls. Yeah, yeah, I'm pulling. Let me know when. All right. You ready? Say when. When. Yeah, it went in. Okay, okay hold on a second. Up. Hold on. It's hung up on the top. It's, it's hung up on the top. Let's see if we can dip it. Actually, here. I'm going to get in here. Lower the jack just a little yeah. bit. Here we go. I'm about to lower it. Stop. Let me see if I could drop this. Okay, it's a little bit more even. On this side, it's out on the bottom, so I tilt it down. That way, or? Mm, that's not moving at all. Right there. Okay. Like a little bit more. See if you can push on. Right there. Because the alignment dowel is aligned. Well, they're all aligned. It's just that the transmission was kind of off. I guess, yeah, there you go. You got any of the transmission bolts that we can start? Yeah. It's as flush as it gets on this side. 
Okay, let me see. Oh, it's all the way in on your side? Pretty much, yeah. Oh, okay, so that's the problem. We're not in on the other side. When you're aligning the transmission, if you have the manpower, you get one person at each wheel well. Right now, we're looking in from the driver's side wheel well, and you get the mud flap out of your way, and you could see the alignment dowels and the holes on the bell housing that they need to marry up to. And Toyota does you a favor, and they paint the hole on the bell housing that the alignment dowel goes into, they paint it blue. So with each person at the wheel well instructing the person on the jack what to do, you can get the alignment. And then once you see that the alignment dowels are lined with the holes on the transmission, you can push from the back and get them started into the dowels. And then it's just a little bit more finagling and you should be able to push it all the way up to the back of the engine like we have it now. And now we're gonna get the bolt started. We got all nine bolts started. You have four of the 14 millimeter bolts on the bottom. You have two 17 millimeter bolts that go on the driver's side, one on the very top, one at about the 10 or 11 o'clock position. And then you have three more 17 millimeter bolts, three o'clock, one or two o'clock, and 12 o'clock. And what made it really easy to get the 17 millimeter ones that are up above is this really long, it's a 31 inch, half inch drive extension with a swivel. And I'm able just to comfortably go from behind the transmission or on the side and get those cinched up. Now we're gonna get the transmission jack out of the way, but first we wanna support the back end of it. And the reason why we wanna get the transmission jack out of our way is so we can more comfortably get in where the transmission jack is to start torquing some of these bolts. Some of them we're not gonna be able to get an accurate torque spec because you have to come in at an angle and when you're torquing something, you have to be at a perfect right angle to the fastener to get the proper torque spec. So those upper ones where I have to use the long extension, I'm just gonna get those to the German spec of Gurindai and call it good. But we're gonna get another jack underneath here with a block supporting the back of the transmission and then Ray is gonna lower the transmission jack and we're gonna get it out of our way. Now that we have the back end of the transmission settled on a block on the hydraulic jack, Ray's gonna lower the transmission jack and get it out of my way. This isn't ideal. It would be nice if you had like a screw bar jack that you can screw up to this height and support it, but we don't have one of those and we're doing the best we can. If you have a jack that will go that high, I would suggest using a jack rather than relying on a hydraulic jack with a wood block, doing what we have to do to get it done. Okay, go and lower it. With the transmission jack out of the way, now I'm gonna torque all nine bell housing bolts. The 14 millimeter bolts on the bottom have a spec of 27 foot-pounds. The 17 millimeter bolts on the upper end have a spec of 53 foot-pounds. I'm gonna start with the 14 millimeter ones because they're the easiest to get to. Well, that's it. That's nothing. Tom just brought up a good point. He said, do you have Loctite on those? I guess it wouldn't hurt to put a little blue Loctite on there, but I haven't heard of bell housing bolts come loose unless you just work a girly man and you tighten them with your torque elbow and you get them tight enough. But if you torque them to spec, they should not back out. All right, got all four of the 14 millimeter ones done. Now I'm gonna raise the torque wrench to 53 and get the 17 millimeter bolts to spec. The lowest one on the passenger side, I could easily get a torque wrench on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and torque it to 53 foot pounds. Now the question is, can I get the next one or will I just go to the big extension? Let me see if I can get on that one and actually torque that one to spec. No way. Okay, I'm just gonna have to now go to the long extension and just go by feel and use the good and tight spec. Knowing that I can't get a proper torque spec because I have to come in at a pretty dramatic angle with a long extension, I tested the 17 millimeter bolt that I could torque to spec just to get an idea how tight it was. And I basically couldn't tighten it anymore with my girly strength, with my big half inch ratchet and the long extension. So I know I'm just gonna get those bolts as tight as I can get them and call it good without going too crazy. As long as I can't turn it anymore with a fair amount of force, I'll know it's tight enough. That's good. So look how good this extension works with the swivel attached. I can get onto the upper passenger bolt right from back of the transmission coming at an angle and I can tighten it. Worked pretty damn good. 
after we got all the transmission bolts tightened to spec or as close as we could just guessing with our torque elbow we found out that the alignment we thought we had with the torque converter with the starter hole it ended up moving on us because when we got one of the flex plate holes in that area we couldn't find the female threads on the torque converter and then we were stuck we we're like how are we going to now turn the torque converter to get the alignment with the flex plate we figured out there's a little access hatch underneath the vehicle i was able to get in with a screwdriver and turn the torque converter while somebody was looking from this access point and said okay now you're aligned we used a telescoping mirror and we used a good light to be able to see when the flex plate hole was lined up with the female threads on the torque converter this is the access hatch i'm talking about it's blocked by a little plastic cover that looks like this and it just got a couple little clips and you can remove that and i wedged the screwdriver in here pushed the screwdriver tip through one of the big holes in the flex plate then i got the tip of the screwdriver against the torque converter and then i just rocked the screwdriver a little bit and then with the person looking in from the wheel well they told me when we got the alignment so that's how we did it this might happen to you we wanted to share this with you that this is how you can move the torque converter to get the alignment with the flex plate if it moved on you one of the six bolts is black and i think the reason why they have that and they tell you to put the black one in first is this way when you finally come around and you finish or you run out of bolts it lets you know that you're done we got one in and now because we got one in the torque converter is going to be turning with the flex plate i'm going to be looking in through the starter hole and tell ray when to stop and then we could get another bolt in go ahead and turn ray all right turn it keep coming keep going keep going right there that's good right there we're choosing to put a little blue 242 loctite just for a little extra insurance because of the tight access we don't know if we're going to be able to get a torque wrench in there we're going to try but we don't know if we're going to be able to get one in there. Another thing we're doing to get these bolts started is we have a short extension and we have a 14 millimeter short socket and we put black tape on it because it would be a real bummer if you dropped the bolt in there and you lost it. So we're trying to remove all the possibility of us screwing up. So each bolt is going to be pushed into the tape and it holds it firm and then we have an extension too to where if we lose the extension hopefully it's going to fall out and not in to the bell housing and then we'll be bumming so these are all these little precautions we're doing to where we're not going to make a mistake we just got the second one in right there yeah so we got two in now and we're going to keep on turning turning yeah just keep going and we'll tell you when to slow down just like kind of go to normal okay slow down all right, a little bit. That's it, right there. We tried our level best to torque the flex plate to torque converter bolts with the torque wrench. We could not get the torque wrench in there to save our lives, so we gave up on it. So what we did is we just got onto the bolts with this longer 3 8 ratchet flex head, a short little 3 8 extension, about like one inch, and then a deep 14 millimeter socket. And what we did, is one person got on the crank bolt, turned the engine to where you could see one bolt in the starter hole, and then they switched the ratchet to where they could apply counter pressure on the crank bolt while the person inside the driver's side wheel well was tightening those 14 millimeter bolts. And we just went by feel. That's the best we can do. And we're pretty much thinking that's the best you're gonna be able to do unless you have some other better way to get a torque wrench in there. We couldn't do it. Now that we got the torque converter properly attached to the flex plate, we can put this little plastic access hatch back in. It just has those plastic clips and you just push up and that's it. That thing was very helpful. And I have to thank one of those Toyota engineers back in Japan for doing that. So now that we have the torque converter properly attached to the flex plate, we're gonna work on getting the starter back in. Before we get the starter in, we got to get the starter cover back in. It just slides into place. No, that's not all the way in. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Now that sucker's all the way in. Now we can drop the starter in from the top down. Is that working? Yeah. There we go. 
Now that I got the starter in place, I'm going to get one of the bolts in. Give me another one. Okay. You can get onto the bottom bolt with a torque wrench. It's 27 foot pounds, and that's the spec. Let me see if I can actually turn it. I might not be able to because of the exhaust manifold in the way. Well, maybe I can get it. I can get it a little bit. Yeah, I think we can. I can get one click. There it is. The starter bolts are both torqued to the spec of 27 foot pounds. Now we got to make the electrical connections. I'm first going to make the power connection to the post on the starter. The positive power is held on to the stud with a 12 millimeter nut. I've already got the nut off. I'm going to reach in here, slide it over the post, and then get the flange nut on there. Then I'm going to use a quarter wrench, ratchet, 12 millimeter socket, and tighten it up. Okay, that's tight. You want to get your plastic cover back in place that covers that connection. We got this little connection here I'm going to make. Snap it in, pull back a little bit. Okay, that's good. And then we have this ground wire that we disconnected. We'll reconnect that. Yeah, it's tight. We're done with the starter. We have it properly attached and all the electrical connections made. We've got the brake line back in position. Remember, we moved it out of our way so we'd have better access to get those torque converter to flex plate bolts. So it just held on with two 12 millimeter bolts, get them back in, attached to the frame. We also disconnected this brake line bracket right here and we got the 10 millimeter bolt back in holding the bracket to the inside of the driver's side fender. We're next gonna get this plate reattached to this bracket on the driver's side. It just held on with the 10 millimeter bolt. Now we're gonna get this hose. I don't know what this little thing is for, but I'm gonna call it a chingadera for my Hispanic friends. And then I'm gonna slide it on the bottom. And then compress these clamps. These are girly clamps. You can compress them with your fingers and get them in place. Voila. We're now done with getting everything back on the driver's side of the engine that we removed to where we can get the starter out and back in. This is the shifter plate for the transfer case. If you remember, I shot a video on fixing the automatic shifter bushings and replacing a shifter seat on my third gen 4Runner. It's gonna be very similar. So with the OEM shifter seat, it's got this rubber seal that sits in in the bottom right here. And what I learned the hard way is that you can't use this Marlin crawler aftermarket shifter seat with that rubber seal because you won't be able to push the shifter in far enough to secure it with the c-clip so you don't need this anymore like we said earlier all that was left of the shifter seat was little granules it was all gone so if you look at the way this marlin crawler shifter seat is made it's got little u cutouts and that's so you can get it by these pins you just fit it in there and then rotate it in place just like that. And then ideally in a perfect world, we would have got this gasket. We don't have the gasket, unfortunately. So we're just gonna have to put this in as is. I wish we had it, but if it starts leaking on Ray, then it'll just have to take a shifter out and replace it. We got the shifter plate back on the transfer case. There obviously is a torque spec for this, but I don't care because I don't feel like looking it up. I'm just gonna go by feel with my shorty ratchet and get them snugged up. It's like a true mechanic, just don't care. Well, Ray can't complain because he's not paying for this. <laughs> he's just helping. And he's buying us lunch, so that's cool. Yeah, yeah what are we having for lunch, Ray? Uh, what do you guys? Philip Minion? Okay, that's good. <laughs> this is the input shaft for the transfer case, and you'll see a shiny little mark right there. That's where the old seal was riding. It's called a witness mark. And the only thing that you'd be worried about if the seal actually wore a little bit of a groove in the input shaft, then you would maybe want to put the seal in the back of the transmission in a little bit of a different spot. So the seal would be riding on another surface on this shaft. I don't detect any indentation. So I think it's going to be okay that we don't remove the seal that the transmission came with and try to drive it in at a different depth. So it would be riding in a different position. The seal 
on the new transmission has a little bit of assembly grease on it, pre-lubricated, but I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of automatic transmission fluid on the shaft just to make sure that when the transmission first starts, there's not gonna be any excessive wear on the seal. I want it lubricated. So we're using the suggested ATF, the WS from Toyota. Okay, that's nice and lubricated. We have the transfer case on the transmission jack and because of the way the transfer case is shaped, with this part where the output shaft for the front drive shaft goes, it's not balanced. It's not like a nice flat pan on the automatic transmission. So what we came up with is we put a plastic two by four up on end to support this side, the passenger side. And then we took a ratchet strap and we ratcheted it so it doesn't move. And then this way we can use the alignment knobs on this transmission jack to get the perfect mating with the transmission. So it's gonna help us by having a transmission jack to get this transfer case connected to the transmission. Go up. This is easy. Okay, a little more. Okay, let me see if I could drop the nose down. I think it's a little, can you see, it's Sean? It's tilted up, uh, not too much. Right there. Hey, you got a good eye. Okay, hold on a second, hold on. Is it hitting the top? Yeah, it's touching the body now. It's for sure. Okay, so we gotta go down on the transmission. Now we need to tilt a little bit. Down? The shaft needs to go up a little bit. We might need to go down on the transfer case. Go down a little bit? Go down a little bit, yeah. Jack. Oh okay. yeah, oh, okay. stop. One pump on the jack there, Tom. Just a little bit. I think it looks like it's a little nose high though. A yeah, little it bit. is a little nose high. Go up a little bit more on the jack. Stop. <laughs> go up a little more. Oh, you're right there, dude. That's, ooh, that's looking good. No, it's, it needs to go up higher. I think we're hitting the top, though. Yeah. No, on the top of what? On the, the body. body. Oh. Okay, back it up a little bit. I'm going to lower the transmission a little bit more. Now we need to drop the trans jack a little bit. Oh, that's Tiny right. bit. Oh, there. Down a little more. A little more. 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 No. Stop, stop. Okay, Are you gonna go up a little bit. Nose? Does it look like it needs adjusting, Sean? It looks pretty square to me. Let me see, move your head down a little bit. It's gonna hit the seal. You gotta. It's gonna hit the seal now, but yeah. it's like... Jack, there you go. Right. A little bit more. There you go. That's too high. That's too high. Mm. Too high? Too high. Go down right right there. A little higher, just a tiny bit. There you go. There it is. It's still hitting the bottom. Go, go forward a little bit. Uh, okay, no, go up a little bit more on the jack. A little bit more. Yeah, there, that's it. You can see the line, Medell? Well, we're too far away, but yeah. We've got most of the bolts for the transfer case torqued to spec. The two most upper ones on the very top near the shifter plate, we couldn't get those torqued to spec because of the angle. We came over the very top with a long wobble extension and a 3 8 swivel. We were able to get the top driver side one tight. The top passenger one, we got that one tight with a quarter inch ratchet and a quarter inch swivel and a 12 millimeter socket. That was the best way to get that one tight. From inside of the cabin, we tried to come over the top for that upper passenger side one, but we couldn't get a good enough straight shot at it because the solenoids were in the way. When you're putting the two top transfer case bolts in, you got to remember there's two wire clips. There's a silver colored one that goes on the passenger side, and then there's a black one that goes on the driver side. And if you forget them, then your wiring harness isn't going to be secured properly, and those things will be dangling around. So make sure you capture those two brackets when you get those two upper bolts in. The next thing we want to do now is we're going to get the transmission mount connected to the transmission and then we're going to get the cross member in place and then we're going to lower the transfer case and transmission assembly down onto the cross member and then get the other four bolts attaching the transmission mount to the cross member and then we'll be able to get the jack out of our way and have more room to do the rest of the work. We're going to get the transmission mount connected to the transmission. If you forgot to mark what side is front and what side is rear. See there's a little half moon. That side goes towards the rear and the protruded half moon goes towards the front, if that makes sense. We're gonna torque these transmission mount bolts to 48 foot-pounds. Drop it down a little bit. There you go. Right, wiggle it. There you go. Wiggle it. Up more. There you go. 
The torque spec for the cross member bolt nut is 53 foot pounds. We're holding the nut with the 14 millimeter box end and I'm tightening the bolt with the torque wrench. There it is, 53. We're gonna do the same with the rest. We've got the four 12 millimeter bolts that hold the transmission mount to the cross member in and we're gonna torque them to spec. It's 14 foot pounds. We ended up painting ourselves into a corner here. We should have disconnected the ratchet strap earlier, but oh well, if this is the worst we do, no big deal. I'm gonna have to cut the ratchet strap and get it disconnected. Now we can drop down the transmission jack and get it out of our way so we have more room to work to make all the electrical connections and to get the drive shafts in place. There was a last bolt we had to get in place for the transfer case. We had the transmission jack in the way, so now with the jack out of the way, we were able to get this bolt in and torque to the 17 foot-pound spec. Now we're gonna get the skid plate back on the transfer case with the four bolts, and they are torqued to 13 foot-pounds. Now we're gonna work on getting all the electrical connections made with the wiring harness. We've got all the wiring connections made from the harness to the transmission and transfer case. If you took them out, you'll figure out how to get them back in. That's about the best I can tell. The plugs are unique and you'll figure it out. Now we're gonna get the cross member support arms in place. The four bolts that attach the cross member support arm from the frame to the cross member, the torque spec is 24 foot pounds. Next, we're gonna get the transmission control cable connected to the driver's side of the transmission. We have this 12 millimeter nut. We gotta take this off the rod and then we gotta slide it into the transmission shift lever from the back side here. It's like keyed a little bit. Let me see if I can get it in there better. There we go. The torque spec for that nut is 10 foot pounds. I'm choosing to support the transmission shift lever with my channel locks, so I'm not gonna apply force to the actual internals of the transmission. That's what I'm trying to avoid to do. Okay, that's at 10 foot pounds. We have to get this clip in that attaches the transmission control cable to this bracket on the side of the transmission. So you just gotta feed it in there. You could almost get it in almost by hand, but I need a mallet. That's fully seated. We just got the oil cooler lines connected and we wanna share some information with you. Quite commonly, we noticed this when we did Sean's 2002 transmission swap, and we're noticing it here on Ray's 2007 FJ Cruiser. The fluid fittings on the passenger side of the transmission might not be at the optimum angle. And if you find that you're having a hard time getting the lines connected, you can break free the fitting with a 19 millimeter open end wrench. You can get on there, and then you can loosen it, and then you can turn the fitting the direction you need to be able to make the line connection. And then you gotta get your brackets in place too. And you have a bracket that goes right here that connects to the bell housing. And then you have the other one that's more forward. And just remember that you want those rubber grommets on the tubing before you capture it with the clamp so you don't get any metal to metal contact and then it'll wear a hole in it. So make sure that those rubber pieces are around the line before you capture it with the bracket. And then after you get the lines connected, you get on here, either a open at 19 or a flare nut 19, holding the fittings steady, applying counter pressure while you get onto the line fitting with the 17 millimeter and you get them tight. And we have everything tight and ready to go. Next, we got the manifold stays in place. They're held on with three 14 millimeter bolts, one that holds it to the exhaust manifold and two up above that hold it to each side of the bell housing. The torque spec is 30 foot-pounds. On this passenger side, you can actually get the torque wrench in there and get one click at a time and you can get it to the spec. There was more room on the driver's side and I got those to the spec easy. This was more of a challenge for those two upper bolts that attach the manifold stay to the bell housing, but you can get it. The torque spec for those manifold stay bolts is 30 foot-pounds. Next, we got the rear drive shaft connected. And if you followed our lead and made match marks, and actually color coded which side was the front connection and which side was the rear connection, you couldn't mix it up. But if you forgot, the slip yoke for the rear drive shaft 
goes towards the transfer case. The torque spec for the nuts and the bolts is 65 foot pounds. For this connection to the transfer case, you can't get a socket on there and a torque wrench, so you just have to go by feel using your torque elbow. So I just got on here with the big 14 millimeter box in, and an easy way to hold the drive shaft steady is you have somebody inside the cab setting the brake for you. So you get a couple tight, and then you have the person, hey, Ray, release the parking brake. And then you turn it, and then you get the other bolts in position, and then you tighten those. So that's the way you can do it without having to put a pry bar or something in between the yoke to hold it steady. You use the parking brake to hold it. An option while you have the drive shaft out, you're gonna have really easy access to all the Zerk fittings for the U-joints and the slip yoke. So you might wanna grease it up while you have it out on the ground and then install it. For the front drive shaft, you can't utilize the parking brake to hold the drive shaft steady. It doesn't work that way. So you have to hold the yoke some way. You can get a pry bar in between the yoke and hold it steady while getting on the nut with your torque wrench and 14 millimeter socket and you could torque it to the 65 foot pound spec. So that's for the connection at the transfer case. For the connection to the front differential, it's a little bit different. You can get the box end wrench on the nut on the back side facing the engine and you can rest it on this front cross member and then you can get onto the bolt head with your torque wrench and 14 millimeter socket and the box end will hold it steady while you tighten it and you can get it to the spec of 65 foot pounds. So that's how we got the front drive shaft bolts and nuts to the torque spec of 65 foot pounds. Next, we got the propeller shaft heat shield in place. Two 12 millimeter bolts, the torque spec is 12 foot pounds. We're now ready to get the exhaust pipes connected. We have new exhaust donuts and there's three different exhaust donuts you need for this project. You got the two, which are the same, that attach the exhaust pipe to the exhaust manifold. That's one type. And then you have another type that goes in between the two pipes that connect together, that crosses over underneath the vehicle. And then you got a unique one, it's a big conical one that goes to this connection that leads to the muffler. So three different types and four total. So you just wanna slide them over, hopefully. There we go, that's in place. And then this one. These are a crush type. You see how it's got flanges on it? This will crush down as you tighten up the nuts. Reversing our procedure, we have to feed this one over the cross member first on the driver's side. Okay, we got that in. This is optional, but a smart thing to do. I bought some new exhaust manifold nuts. These are a locking type of nut. They have a unique shape to them and they're meant to where you get them on and they don't come off all that easy. So that's one of the reasons why you might want to replace them because they have that locking feature and the locking feature might not work so well if you try to reuse them. We have both exhaust pipes installed with new exhaust gasket donuts. Here's the torque specs. The two bolts that attach the front exhaust pipe to the rear exhaust pipe with the springs, those are torqued to 32 foot-pounds. The crossover connection with the two bolts, the torque spec for those is 35 foot-pounds. For the two front connections, the nuts are torqued to 40 foot-pounds. From our experience, the torque spec for these seems pretty darn high. And when you start cranking on them, you start to cringe because if you break off one of those studs, especially in the manifold, you're gonna be in a world of hurt because now you gotta drill it out and it's gonna be a pain in the butt. So I suggest just go by feel, get them nice and snug and call it good. But you do have the torque spec if you wanna tighten them to the recommended spec that Toyota gives. Now that we have the exhaust pipes in, we wanna connect up the O2 sensors. And then there's one on the driver's side. We installed this exhaust stopper bracket with the two 12 millimeter bolts the torque spec is 14 foot pounds. We didn't bother to try to get a torque wrench in there. We used a quarter inch ratchet and a short quarter inch extension with a 12 millimeter socket and we just got them good and tight. We also slid over this exhaust hanger rubber grommet attaching the exhaust crossover pipe to this connection that attaches to the frame. Now we're gonna get the heat shield in place that we removed 
to have an easier time removing the crossover pipe. We got the heat shield back in place above that stopper bracket with the three 10 millimeter nuts. No torque spec for this. We're just gonna get them snugged up with the quarter inch ratchet. So we're gonna get the transfer case shifter in. The rod doesn't go into the spring. It goes to the right side of the spring. You line up the alignment dowels and you push the spring in a little bit towards the driver's side and you drop it in. And then you bring down the spring, the next little cover, and then the top cover. And then you have to push it down and get the C-clip in. There it is. Now that we have the clip in place, we can put the boot over and it should snap in on the bottom. Tug up a little bit, it's in there. Now we're gonna get the boot in place. And then we gotta get the four little bolts started. These are actually like screws, they're not bolts. These screws are going into plastic clips, so don't go too tight, you'll strip them. Okay, those are all tight. Next, we're gonna get the automatic transmission shifter in place. We thread the transmission cable through the shifter, and then we got the stud through the little bracket that it connects to, and now we have to get the 12 millimeter nut installed. And then remember, we made a paint mark where the nut was locked into that bracket so we can get it in the same spot. After getting the nut installed on the stud, you wanna pull back and get the cable into the back hole of the shifter. And then you have to grab your retaining clip with the protruding flange facing the shifter and you gotta get that sucker in there. I could just push it in with my hand. I think that's all the way in. Yep. Getting the end of the cable attached with the nut in the same position was a little problematic. What we ended up doing is shifting it down a few gears from neutral, got the nut on, and then Sean got onto the nut with a socket and 3 8 ratchet and I shifted up towards neutral while he was holding the socket on there and then he was able to keep the cable sliding forward and then when he saw that it was aligned with our match marks that we made to make sure we can get in the right spot, he tightened it down. So it was kind of a two-person operation to get that in the right position. And now that we have that in the right position and tight and tight, we're gonna get the shifter attached to the body. We've got the four bolts that attach the shifter to the body. They're 12 millimeter. The torque spec is 10 foot pounds. We're just gonna go by feel with my shorty ratchet, a six inch extension and a 12 millimeter socket. Now that we got the shifter attached to the body, we're gonna make the electrical connections. And then the light right here. Now we're gonna get the console cover in place. Remember to have the brake up so it helps you get it on. And then we have this parking brake stopper cover to get in place. This should snap in place. We drained the transfer case. And so we're gonna do that next. We're gonna fill the transfer case with some fresh 75W90 gear oil. Now we're at the point where we wanna get the proper amount of automatic transmission fluid into the remanufactured transmission from Toyota. We weren't sure, so we called Stevens Creek Toyota, the dealership that sold us a transmission, and we asked, does the transmission come with some fluid? And one of the parts guys, Marcus, nice guy, he asked one of their back counter technicians, and they said they come with about eight quarts and the capacity of this transmission is about 12. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take out the fill plug and we're gonna pump in about four and a half more quarts, a little bit more than we need. And then after that, we're gonna get the truck dropped down onto the ground, level ground, and then we're gonna start this thing up and go through the fluid level procedure. To pump the automatic transmission fluid into the transmission, I've got this new mode of power fill. You pour the fluid in, and then you pump the handle, you get it up to pressure, and then it will force it out through the nozzle. And so I have to get up into this fuel plug. It's towards the back of the transmission on the passenger side. And I'm gonna hook it in there and open up the valve and hopefully not make a mess. 
We've got the truck on flat ground. We're getting ready to start it up and do the fluid checking procedure. We have to connect the battery. We're gonna reconnect the negative terminal, 10 millimeter nut and tighten it up. Now that we got the estimated amount of fluid we needed to add to the transmission, we added about four and a half quarts. We're gonna go through the fluid level procedure with you. This is straight out of the factory service manual, Tech Info. They say to circulate the fluid. So you allow the engine to idle with the air conditioning off you move the shift lever through the entire gear range to circulate the fluid and you allow the engine to idle until the fluid temperature reaches 97 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we go to the fluid temperature check procedure. Now they talk about using an intelligent tester. Most people aren't going to have that. That's for like Toyota technicians. So let's go to the procedure when you don't have an intelligent tester. And this procedure is when you don't have an ability to check your transmission temperature. If you have a scan gauge or another way to view your transmission temperature, then you won't need to do this. But if you don't have a way to read your transmission temperature, this is how you would do it. You need to jump a couple of the terminals at the OBD2 reader inside your vehicle. It shows you from the wide section of the connector, you go four over from the left, they call that the CG connector. And then the other one you have to connect is the TC connector, that's five over from the left. So pin four and pin 13 need to be jumped. I don't know of a jumper that works for that, so you could use a paper clip. It can't be one of the cheap paper clips that has like a coating, it has to be an actual steel type of paper clip so it gets a good connection. I talked to Joey at Wits Inn and he's talking about making one for people to be able to use for this application. So we might have a link for you in the future. So once you jump those connectors, you slowly move the shift lever from park to low, and then you return it to park. You basically shift through all the gears and then back to park. And then what you do is you move the shift lever to drive, and then you quickly move it back and forth from neutral to drive, once within a 1.5 second interval for at least six seconds, and this will activate the fluid temperature detection mode. The automatic transmission oil temp warning light remains illuminated for two seconds, and then it turns off. Then you allow the engine to idle until the fluid temperature reaches 97 degrees. The oil temp light will come on again when the fluid temperature reaches 97 degrees and then it will blink when it exceeds 115. You want to check your fluid level when you're between 97 degrees and 115. That is the range. And then when it comes to checking the fluid level with the engine running, you remove the overflow plug and then you check to see that fluid drains out of the overflow tube and then you wait till the flow becomes a trickle and then you reinstall the plug and you lock it down and you're good. If fluid didn't come out of the overflow, then you would add a little bit of fluid, 0.4 liters or 0.2 quarts, a quarter of a quart, then you would repeat that procedure until you get fluid flowing out of the hole and then once you do, you let it get down to a trickle and then you close the plug and you're done with the fluid level procedure. So now we're gonna go through the fluid level check procedure. Remember the range is 97 to 115. That's an 18 degrees range. We're gonna choose to get that in the middle of the range. So half of 18 is nine, nine plus 97 is 106. We're gonna try to get the trans temp to about 106 and then we're gonna get underneath the vehicle. We're gonna open up that overflow plug. We're hopefully gonna see fluid pour out, knowing that the fluid was a little bit above what we needed. And then when it gets down to a trickle, we're gonna close that plug off and we're good. If we don't see fluid coming out, that means we're a little bit underfilled. We're gonna pump in a little bit more, like a quarter of a quart. And then once we see fluid coming out the overflow plug, then we know we've gotten it to the right level. We let it get down to a trickle and then we'll close that plug up and we're done. We're gonna compare what the scan gauge is seeing what the temp is, and then I'm gonna get underneath there with an infrared thermometer, and I'm gonna point that at one of the transmission cooler lines, the send line, which is the temperature of the fluid that it's sending to the trans cooler, and then coming back to the transmission on the return line. That's the temperature that is being advertised on the scan gauge. It's the temperature of the fluid before it goes to the trans cooler and then comes back. Okay, we got it at about the right temperature, about 105. We're gonna get underneath the vehicle. Okay, I got a five millimeter Allen. I'm gonna open up the, the overflow plug. 
Okay, fluid is dripping out. We know we're at the right level. And it's going down to a trickle, and that's about right. Okay, I'm gonna close it off. If fluid didn't come out, like I said earlier, you're gonna have to put more fluid in the fill plug area, and then once it starts coming out of the overflow, then you know you're good. So you just have to add a little bit more, and then get it to where it's pouring out, and you know you're good. And then when you know you're good, just lock this thing down. I don't know the torque spec, just get it nice and snug and call it good. I was able to determine just from an infrared thermometer which one of these fittings on the side of the transmission that connect up to the trans cooler lines is the send line and which is the return line just by looking at the temperature so if i point at the bottom one it shows 107 and then if i point at the same area of the fitting on the upper one i'm getting 98 and so it's logic to me that this one right here is a send line it's sending the hot fluid to the trans cooler and it's returning on here and that's why we're getting two different temperatures you're going to get more of a range when it's running that the cooler's continually returning cooler fluid on that upper line. So you'll see an even bigger disparity when we were checking it earlier, about a 20 degrees difference between the lower fitting and the upper fitting because the engine's running and actively cooling that fluid. So no doubt in my mind, the bottom fitting is the send line sending the hot fluid and the upper one is the return line getting the cooled fluid back into the transmission. When Ray told me the temperature he was getting at the scan gauge it very closely correlated with the temperature of the lower elbow the send line if you don't have a way to read the temperature this could be a fairly accurate way for you to determine the temperature when you're doing the fluid level check procedure just by using an infrared thermometer and you could get these pretty cheap so that's another way you can do it if you wanted to he was showing 105 at the scan gauge and i was showing 106 at this fitting so it's a pretty darn accurate way to read it in my opinion now let's go over how you would adjust your shifter to make sure you've got it properly adjusted i'm going to show you the shift lever and show you how to go into neutral manually by manipulating the shift lever the instructions say to get the shifter in neutral from the farthest forward position go back two notches one two so we're looking at the shifter from the passenger side and you have this access port and you want to get in there with a small ratchet with a 12 millimeter socket i'm using my quarter inch ratchet you can loosen the 10 millimeter nut with the gear shift in neutral so now we have the actual shift lever on the transmission in the neutral position we have the shifter in the neutral position and then now everything should be in its proper alignment whether you have the cable too tight or too loose once you loosen the 12 millimeter nut the cable is gonna either push forward or pull back and get into that happy spot and then you lock the nut down with your ratchet and then you should now have a properly adjusted shift lever we'll double check that in a second so i'm just going to get in there with my socket and i'm going to cinch this down okay we're going to go back in the park we're going to start this thing up and what we're going to want to see is when we go into reverse neutral drive third second and low that the lights are going to light up on the dash indicating you're in those gears and we're also going to make sure when we shift in the reverse we feel it engage and we feel like it's going to go in reverse when we go into neutral it shouldn't be doing anything when it goes into drive we should feel it shift in the drive and want to bring the vehicle forward and then same with the other gears third and second and the low you should feel like the vehicle wants to move forward like it normally should so we're going to start it up and check that out okay ray's going to shift in reverse we feel like it's going to go in reverse and then we look at the indicator light on the dash and it shows the reverse. Now we're gonna try neutral. We just figured out a problem. Ray would shift into neutral. The indicator light on the dash wouldn't show he was in neutral. And it was a slight adjustment with the park neutral safety switch. You could see there's an ability for a little bit of adjustment. Is the light on right now? Light is on. Okay, now is the light on now? Light is off. The shift lever on the driver's side is in neutral, but there's a, an ability to adjust this a little bit. So in this position, it's off, right? It's off, right? Yeah, so now, and then, is it on now? It's on now. Okay, so if you find that your indicator light's not showing you a neutral, it's an adjustment right here 
at the park neutral safety switch. So it's on right now, isn't it, Ray? On. And it's off right here? Off. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it over here. It's on now, right? On. Okay, so I'm gonna lock this 12 millimeter nut right here. So now the park neutral safety switch is gonna be properly adjusted in relation to the shift lever. Okay, now we're gonna try this again. So he's gonna shift in the reverse. It goes in a reverse, okay? Shift it in neutral. We got a light, cool. Go in the drive. Feels like it went in the drive. We've got a light. Go in the fourth, we got fourth. We've got third. We've got two. And we've got low. So now we have a properly adjusted shifter. So, all right, we are all done with this job. As you saw, there were some hurdles we had to get past. The main hurdle we struggled with was first breaking free the torque converted to flex plate bolts and getting them out to get the transmission out. And then after we got the transmission back in, getting the flex plate hole to line up with the female threads on the torque converter and getting those lined up to get that first bolt in, that was a little bit of a struggle for us. When it came to being able to turn the torque converter and you saw that I was able to go underneath through that little access hatch, that ended up being a nice access to get in with the screwdriver for me to turn the torque converter while Sean was looking in through the driver's side wheel well with a mirror and a flashlight to let me know, hey, we've got the alignment, stop. I also think if you wanted, you could come in through the wheel well and push a screwdriver firmly against the torque converter, like maybe the sharp edge of a flat plate screwdriver and be able to turn it. But then you're kind of in the area where you need to be looking for the alignment. So it was kind of nice to be able to move the torque converter from the bottom while somebody was carefully watching from the wheel well to let me know, hey, we got the proper alignment stop and then we can get that first bolt started. And then once you got that first bolt started, then it, everything's easy. Then you just simply rotate the engine, get the next bolt hole in the starter area, get that one started. Then you just have to keep on doing that till you get all six bolts started and then slowly tighten them all up and get them to the torque spec. Another stumbling block that's pretty much always a stumbling block with a transmission replacement is the wiring harness can be really difficult to remove because number one, the clips have grit in them and you push the release button, but then you pull back and nothing's happening and you're contorting yourself to get in there and you just get fatigued and you get frustrated and you end up cursing a lot like I do. So I would suggest maybe buy some electrical contact cleaner, maybe spray it behind the clip to hopefully loosen some grit, like little pieces of dirt or rocks that get up there. If you four wheel a lot, you're gonna be having a lot of dirt and dust and maybe mud getting on those connectors and that just makes it very difficult to make the disconnects on all those plugs and there's quite a few of them. The other thing that makes it difficult is the harness is connected to the transmission and transfer case with brackets and some of those brackets are hard to get to. They're out of sight on top of the transmission and you're going by field. It's like you're blind and you're using braille. They are a test of patience so we wish we could have showed you a lot of detail on that, but to be able to get your hand in there and the camera at the same time, it's almost impossible. There's just not enough room. Sean and I both agreed that if you had a body lift on your FJ Cruiser, it would make it a lot easier for you to get your hand in there and to be able to see what you're doing too. Because maybe with that extra, maybe couple inches of room, if you had a two inch body lift, you could get your eyes up in there and you could see where you need to get a tool to disconnect a bracket or release a wiring harness clip. So just know, it's gonna fight you, and if you start getting frustrated, just get out from underneath the rig, take a break, and then get back to it. You'll eventually get it, because we did it, but it was time consuming and frustrating, so just know that. When it comes to getting the fluid level right, the information we got from Stevens Creek Toyota was accurate. That automatic transmission system holds, from what I've heard, exactly 12 quarts, and I heard from Stevens Creek Toyota that the factory puts in about eight quarts and it's shipped like that. When I used that Midivac fluid pump, I pumped in about four and a half quarts because I wanted to go a little bit over the capacity. So when we got it to operating temperature and I opened up the overflow plug, I would see fluid come through the spout and trickle out and into the drain pan. It's really important for you to be able to monitor your transmission temperature, not just for a job like this, but for you to be able to know when it's prudent to pull off the highway or 
pull off the trail and give your transmission a rest. Ignorance isn't bliss when it comes to monitoring your transmission temps or your engine temp or your charging volts. Ignorance is dangerous because it can leave you stranded. So if you were on a trip and you're going up a long steady grade and you're loaded down with gear and you have people in your rig and it's causing a heavy strain on the engine and the transmission, your transmission temp and your engine coolant temp could be going through the roof and if you're not monitoring it, you're totally oblivious and you could burn up your motor, you could burn up your transmission. So it's super important to monitor your engine coolant temp and your transmission temperature so you avoid a catastrophe and have to replace a very expensive engine or a very expensive transmission. If you didn't have a scan gauge or another way to monitor your transmission temp, we did show you how to do the jumper where the automatic transmission fluid light will come on and then go off and then it'll come on again when you reach 97 degrees and then it will start blinking when you hit 115. You could do it that way but we don't recommend it. We recommend you invest in a scan gauge and use the codes that we're going to put in the video description for you and so you can be monitoring your trans temperature all the time so you can have the knowledge you need to avoid burning up your transmission on a trip. The other hurdle that we had in this job that we didn't have in the third generation Forerunner automatic transmission replacement was dealing with all the exhaust sections. Exhaust nuts and bolts are notorious for getting really locked in and it's very common you can break them. You saw us be really careful in our approach to it. We first used some penetrant. We tested to see how much force was going to be needed to remove it. Found out, hey, that's a lot of force. We could break off one of the exhaust manifold studs, which would be a nightmare because if you do that, now you're forced with either trying to drill it out and retap it with the exhaust manifold on the vehicle, or you decide to pull the exhaust manifold out, put the exhaust manifold on a bench vise, and then do it in your garage. Both ways are time consuming and are a pain in the butt, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. So take the time and be patient. Use some penetrant, try it out. If it's really tough, stop. Don't force it. Get your butane torch out and heat it up. Give it another shot. Give a fair amount of force. If it's not going, stop. Give it some more heat and keep on doing that. Trying it out and pretty soon with a moderate amount of force, you're hopefully gonna find that it breaks free and you got the nuts off clean or you got the bolts off on the other sections clean and then you avoided a minor catastrophe where it's gonna take you a bunch of time to drill out things and retap, which is not fun. If you've ever done it, it's not a really fun project to do. It's not a sick mod. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toy at a Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Ray. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Peace out. Bye-bye. Take care and happy ranching, people. Bye-bye.